next piece comes from a guy that I respect a ton. I followed him on Twitter for a long time. That is Richie Nakano. He's out of San Francisco. He is very active on Twitter and very opinionated on a lot of news. And I've covered him on the podcast before, but he's recently taken a job at Chef's Feed, which I think is really cool. I would love to get him on the podcast for an interview someday, but I'm just so happy that he's writing and producing content for them. And he put out this piece that is pretty relevant to a lot of stuff that we've been covering over the past uh, few weeks or so. And it's called The Unspoken Rules of the Fickle Inspiration Game. And I really hate to quote so much of this article, but it's like he took a lot of words right out of my mouth, so I'm going to read a lot of it. So, quote, Though the line between drawing inspiration and outright stealing can be a tricky line to walk, stealing isn't always bad, as long as you do it the right way. Corey Lee's in situ, an entire restaurant as a cover band recreating the culinary world's masterpieces as museum-worthy expositions down to every garnish, is one example. It's a simple game of giving credit where credit is due after putting your own spin on it, making it an homage, as Lee does. And then he goes on to talk about... um how chefs, as they get inspired by other chefs, either in person at guest chef dinners or they see a photo on Instagram and they think it's a good idea, quote, one of the most common things chefs say to each other after they've tried something they love is, quote, I'm going to steal this, end quote. It serves as both a compliment and a heads up, but what else is implicitly expected? At attribution. Doesn't have to be a grand statement, but it's got to be something, clever or direct, on social media or on your menu. No, there's no need to list everyone who played a part in the dish's conception on your small plate section, but a good rule of thumb seems to be let the person know, either in person or in a reverential social media tagging sort of way, and maybe describe that dish in a little subtle way that pays tribute. And that's referencing something like, well, I wanted to do something. To like the arpege egg, but spin it in this way. Or I saw Thomas Keller do the uh, salmon cornet, and I thought ice cream cone, blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? So uh, not necessarily saying that this is their dish, because you are putting your own spin on it, but kind of drawing, connecting the uh, degrees of separation, right, back one to where you got the idea from, right? Uh it says another quote, quote, if you do nothing, you might just be an asshole, end quote. And then the last uh, point I'll read from this article saying, quote, otherwise, the vast majority of the hashtag chef life hashtag will be bald confessions of culinary inadequacy will look like opportunists masquerading as creators. I think that's a great quote. We don't want to be opportunists masquerading as creators. So, I know I read a lot of this article out loud. It's uh, probably double the length of what I basically just audibly said, but it's written in a way that I, again, almost nearly 100% agree with, but have yet to put words to myself on chefs getting inspired in the creative process. It does reference social media and the speed at which ideas travel. It talks about the infallible desire of chefs to be creative. And when you get to that stage in your career where you can cook almost anything, if given enough time and learn how, the competitive advantage that you have is kind of your ideas and how those ideas get presented to the guest. And when I'm guilty myself of remixing ideas and pushing the notion of remixing ideas to you folks, I have to cover these kind of asterisk style articles that's like, yes, be inspired from a myriad of different places, but don't then also claim that you are this 100% original, never been seen before phenom of a creative genius, right? Because we're all getting our ideas constantly from different places. So the moral of the story being, if you have an opportunity to either, like I said, draw that degree of inspiration back or connect that dot one uh, stage backwards to where you were inspired by, especially if it's like you're serving a dish out of a hollow egg, dude, like you got that from somewhere, right? That's not your idea, right? I think that's where this article is pushing people towards. Last industry story is might come as a bit of a shock to some of you folks, actually, because I'm about to semi-agree with a piece written by Ryan Sutton. And this might be a first on the Emotion Podcast. He put out this piece called Dear Expensive Restaurants, Stop Posting Online Menus Without Prices. And I want to talk about it. So his gripes are like Cosme puts their menu on their website. And it basically shows you a PDF of what you would get handed as a PDF, as a printed menu when you sit down. But it's missing that critical piece of info. Prices on dishes or the price on the tasting menu. 
And Ryan is salty about it, saying, quote, hiding the cost prevents consumers from engaging in any type of informed planning, something that's particularly important for upscale venues, such as these where people may be saving up for a splurge meal. It also makes it harder to watch for price hikes, like at Cosme, where the duck carnitas has jumped from $45 to nearly $98 since 2014, and for comparing prices with its competitors. So Joe and I want to go out for steak. I say we should go to this steak place. Uh, the steak is $54. If you don't list the price, Joe and I risk going to a place where it's $105 for a steak. That would be pretty shitty if we're doing research. So yes, there is the stereotypical Ryan Sutton complaining about why do things cost so much in this piece, he says as he rolls his eyes. But where this agreement comes from, and the reason that I am actually endorsing what he's saying, is me asking myself... Where does the benefit lie in not actively listing the prices? Because if you're saying that you would lose people if you listed prices on your website, you risk doing something much worse, arguably, my opinion, which is causing that sticker shock at the table. Why not let that guest see the prices, say, oh, that's a little bit too much for my liking, and then choose a different spot? Why would you make that uncomfortable scenario happen while they're in your four walls? And then I think about a thing that we do at Voyager's Table. We have a lot of people that reach out to us because they found us on Instagram or they like it's a cold lead or you know what I mean? They've been to an event before, but they've never actually worked with us yet. And they reach out and they say they want to do a private dinner with us. And I send them this graphically designed piece that I made, which is basically example menus, basically to show if you're looking for beef tenderloin with roasted potatoes and asparagus, that's not really what we do. And it says in that PDF that all menus are custom because that's what we pride ourselves on. And it's a great way to filter people from saying, yes, I want to do this event, but then saying, I want mixed green salad with goat cheese and sliced apples. It's probably not the best choice for you to work with us because we don't have that. Like we don't make that. We will make that if that's what you want to do, but it will probably be more expensive than someone who has that as an option on their catering menu. But the kicker is that I also include pricing for each menu with that PDF. There are numbers that go along with, you want this menu, here's an example menu, here's what that example menu costs. Because it shows potential clients, look, we aren't going to be the cheapest option for you, but this is what you can expect. And it is an incredible time saver for us. I used to write custom menus when a client was just in the proposal phase that was before we used to take deposits, like I would work for that client before getting paid and then realize the client was literally just shopping around. And that's arguably what 90% plus of people are doing when they look at your menu online. They're shopping around. If they are dead set on coming, if they read an article about you, if their friends told uh, you have to go to Cosme, they don't care the price for the most part. They're going to go. They care if you are pitching it as like a $2 sign thing on Yelp and they go and it's a $400 tasting menu. But like for the most part, if you're set on going, you're probably just looking at the menu online to see like, what are they serving right now? What's the what's the main course meat right now? So where is it productive to not list prices? I'm genuinely curious. I want someone to tell me we've seen a 25% increase in booking conversion since we removed our prices and people are happy to pay what we charge because X, Y, Z. Like, I want that case study. But currently, thinking through, like, guest experience and uh, people hating things like airlines that nickel and dime them because they show one price when you're booking and then they change the price when you get there, like, that pisses people off. So I don't see where it is beneficial to not list prices. So I want to know a case study where it's the opposite. I want to hear a story that proves me wrong. Because I get it. Once you have a certain level of reputation and you identify your audience, if those people happen to be affluent and money isn't an object for them, I see why you wouldn't want to list prices because it's the difference between, what it is is it's a difference between driving past a Ford dealership where they've got big neon numbers on the car and they show you how much it is or how much it costs per month versus going to an Aston Martin dealership or showroom where the idea is that you go in, you try the car. If you want to buy, you're going to come with a plan of how you're going to pay for it. But the difference is, And Aston Martin is $200,000 and the muscles at Lilia in Brooklyn is less than 30 bucks. 
again, I don't know what the price is because they don't list their prices. I guess the biggest thing for me is like, be real with people. If we're going to confidently say that the roast chicken costs $78 for two people, don't apologize for it. Because what you're saying in, in confidently dictating your price is, it's $78. With that, I can pay my people what I feel good about. I pay my purveyors what I feel good about. I get to take home enough so that I can be open next year. It's that shtick in filmmaking. Don't treat the audience like they're stupid. Your guests aren't stupid. You aren't pulling a fast one on them by not presenting the numbers until they're seated at table 12. If anything, that further perpetuates people on Yelp from going on and screenshotting your menus and posting their check averages on Google Maps, which ultimately takes the control away from you. Because you could have someone spend $15 on the mussels and $24 on the fettuccine and $15 on a glass of wine, but when they go on to make their Google review... They only talk about the food, and they say they spent 65 bucks at your place with tax and tip, and all of a sudden people are calling you overpriced because they forgot to mention the wine. When you take ownership and you tell the story, you can control the facts and the narrative that gets painted about your business. So, I'm truly eager to see some counter-arguments on this. Please let me know. All right, let's talk about non